around May. Howard, would you tell me a little bit about, oh, kind of how you got started? You, some of the things uh, in your garden here, uh, give us some hints about yourself. Yeah, well. You, uh, you talk about being very young boy <clears throat> and, and having uh, an injury, a, a hernia, and, and uh, being healed through prayer. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about the call to preach? And yeah, well, George, you know, most of, of the people stuff? don't know when they're called to preach. A lot of people don't even know when they're saved or think they don't. See, the thing about it was, the Bible says, try the Spirit to see whether of God or not. Well, I didn't understand that for years, but when God called me to preach, there's a feeling that come to me, it was a divine feeling. And I got to go into God alone. I said, I, I know God, and uh, I know it's good for other people to pray for you, but what about my own faith? That's me and you, God. And I said, this is it now, and uh, I'm gonna trust in you. To have enough faith, uh, there's, two, there's two ways. People who are weak in the faith need stronger people to pray with them. But if you're strong enough in the faith, it says to go in the closet and close the door and pray alone. And it says, uh, it says there, uh, uh, if you go to him and ask anything in his name, uh, if you're keeping his word and all, that he will do it, you know. Because uh, really, you see, when a man does something, it's supposed to be for people. Because that's one thing that's wrong with the world. See, everybody does everything for himself and for his family. Well, I've ignored my family and let them learn to make their own living. And my wife's gone with me a lot of times, spending money and time in this garden. You don't need that. You're too old to fool with such as that. Well, it wasn't me that needed it. The world needed it. Howard, you've uh, been a lot of things. You, you said some folks called you a preacher and some a bicycle man and some a TV man. Yeah. But you seem to call yourself most often a man of vision. Yeah. You, uh... Yeah. Right here, with the garden in the background, you got a couple of things. This, this sign, I'm chosen of God to warn this world of the unbelievable consuming of its destination, the very end of every speck of dust gone forever. More, I've seen it already, and to wait my change of times to a planet beyond the light of this sun. Yeah, well, I tell you, George, uh, when I was two years old, my sister was 14 years old, she died. When I was two years old, we had a mater patch above the road and one below the road, and the first vision I ever had was two years old. And I went to the house and asked my brother and sister where Abby was, uh, where my mother was, and they told me she was the mater patch. Well, I went to the mater patch below the road, and she was the mater patch above the road, so I got down there in the weeds by myself, and I started crying. I was looking for my mother. She wasn't there. And while I was there in this old mill road, my sister started coming right down out of the clouds, you know. And, uh, and, uh, the she, sister who died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She started coming down, and there's three steps come before her as she used them, and three went away behind her, and one she was standing on was seven steps all the time, just coming before her and left behind her. She got down with about 36 inches of the ground in the middle of that mill road, and she went right back up at the same angle, about a 45-degree angle, and those steps left behind her and come in the front of her. She went up just like it did when they come down. It's a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. It's never varied one minute all my life. It's mm -hmm. done right there with me. And when I, uh, when I seen her and knew who she was, instead of crying for my mother, I started calling her name and crying for her. I wanted her to, to see after me, you know. Uh -huh. But I knew nothing about visions, and I knew nothing about the dead coming to life. I didn't even know anything about people died. Anyhow, uh, when she come down, I seen her, and I know it was not illusion because I was crying for my mother when she came. Uh -huh. And then when she came and I saw her, I started for her for help. And she got up about 14, 15 feet high, and I called her name, she looked back over her shoulder, and when she did, she twisted kind of, and there's a big white gown just went down to below her feet, just come around. Uh -huh. When that white gown pulled around, she had on a familiar skirt that I'd seen her wear at the house, you know. Uh -huh. And when I seen her then, and called her name, and she just disappeared, well, I was alone again, and I started crying again, and all I knew to do was run back to the house, and I run back to the house and told my mother I'd seen Abby. Uh -huh. Well, my mother was curious, you know, she thought something was gonna happen to me, and, and she was worried to death because I told her Abby was down there and I couldn't get her stopped, you know, she just went away. And, uh, so all of my mother's life that she lived, she wondered about that. Uh, well, have all you ever of painted my, that vision? No, I, I've, I've been uh, thinking I would. I've sketched it off a time or two. Do, do, and, uh, are some of your other paintings from visions? Do, yeah, all of them. Just, yeah, about all of my name. paintings are visions. And uh, so <clears throat> I lived and preached nearly 50 years without knowing what that meant. 
But I knew I'd had that vision. Me and my mother neither knew what that meant. None of us knew what it meant. But when I dipped my finger in paint and, and that feeling come over to paint sacred art, then uh, I, I collected the thought, God put an index on your brain that you would be a man of vision when you was three years old. Uh -huh. And now the time's come after you've done your pastoral work and you sat down here to retire and everything. And one day I looked out after I'd retired a few years and been working on the garden and I had a feeling, you know, uh, maybe something else out there that I ought to do. I feel a little guilty. I've been with people all my life. I've been with children. I've been in big revivals. I feel a little guilty. And, and I just said, God, if there's anything out there, you just open my door and I'll be there. And I just kind of joking a little with the Lord, sort of to get it off of my mind. But then they started opening doors from Miami to New York. One man shows, university here, a college there. And I've been traveling ever since. And every time that somebody calls me and say, Mr. Foster, we want you to come and uh, uh, in the opening show of our gallery here, I'll think of what I told God. I says, if there's anything else out, you'll open my door, I'll be there. I got a feeling that a lot of that message is right here where we're standing. Yeah. Right up here we've got Howard, the man of vision. This, this is your own painting of yourself. Yeah, it? that there's a canvas there. That's me looking out. When I'm not here, while well, people come along and see me, that's hard to keep stuff up like that well, out in the weather. You served close to a thousand people in funerals and weddings. Yeah. An unknown number of baptisms, pastored nine churches. And at this point, you'd done 1,464 paintings yeah. between 1976 and 1979. How many yeah. paintings have you done by this uh, time? I'm on 2,007 right now. 2000. Well, let's, let's go in this garden and, and see some more of this vision. Uh, George, that gate right there was designed for people that's crippled, you know, and they can't walk. And I drive them down in there in a the car. One time, one year a while back, there's a woman come here with a little boy, and he's a cast, in a cast up to his hip. And he wanted to see the garden so bad, you know, and I think I need a rolling chair. And I told her, I said, I tell you what, if he wants to see the garden, he'll see it. I said, let me go get my wheelbar. And I put him in a wheelbar and took him all over that garden. And he just laid there that wheelbar and looked at everything. <laughs> You know. Got it to her. Yeah, there's a little gate right here. I'll unlock it, and you can go in and out this to the door. See, sometimes now people come here in the middle of the summer, say, if you come here a month from now, this thing will be tens of thousands of flowers and roses and everything. You see, all that stuff coming up in them beds, flowers. They get up waist high. And that bush there is a flower. And flowers are, this, this rose bush here will just be like a blanket. And that lily on sticking through, see, it'll be blooming. And that pecan tree's coming through that. And uh, what, uh, uh, I wondered, my sister come here one day and says, how do you get these things to grow so big? See, at marigolds, uh, they usually grow about, now, well, up, when I was up in North Carolina, up in the mountains, they just grow about that high. Well, my marigolds get up six and seven foot high. My old, old maids, I call them, I call them seniors, they got up to six and seven foot high in there. And my sister's over here one day. Well, going and see some of Yeah. Well, now, when summer comes, they'll be there. Nothing happens. If they'd done like they did last year, I had a marigold six and seven foot. They come up way up towards the blades on that. Well, this is blueberries here. Fine, good. Be yeah. nice ones. My grapes and food and everything grows just sort of like the Garden of Eden. Everything grows together. E everything yeah. seems to grow a little differently here. How do you explain that? Well, uh, I talked to my plant and uh, I asked the blessing of God on them. And uh, if they fail, uh, it's just like some people fail. It you have lots of, looks like spaceships in, in your painting. Yeah, I have uh, visions of other crafts, you know, of solar heat crafts and uh, crafts from other worlds, you know. That's city water. They're up, out two or three hiding around your people. Right? That's the iris is blooming right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, this vine right here, <clears throat> you see these big buds on it? Well, I, I took a rose off that vine last year. It measured 10 inches across. That's, that's as big as most of the people's head is. And I well, uh, took some talking and praying, didn't it? Yeah. To get a 10-inch rose? Yeah, and I put that, I put that rose in an 8-inch mayonnaise jar, and the petals turned up on the edge. It proves it's 8 inches now, and it was 10 when I put it in there, and it's preserved. Now it's over there in the jar. 
Because people wouldn't believe it, you know, if I had a couple of rows. I might have to see that myself. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Thomas had to see every, see everything before he believed. You know, I've been that way. I was sort of that way, you know, when when the Lord said, hey, you can preach all over the world and stay in your yard. I was sort of like Thomas, you know. I'd have to see that before yes, I believed sir. it. Yes, sir. Yeah. And now uh, we're walking through all these nice plants. Somebody told me you had an unusual fig tree. Fig tree, yeah, that's, that's fig trees right up here. Uh, those are daisies, black-eyed Susie's coming up right oh, there. Yeah. Uh -huh. I have messages all around, you know, and lily trees. I have pear trees that comes up. That's a pear tree come up from a seed right in yonder, see, by that gate. Uh -huh. That pear tree there, and that fine pear, I have a ball and pear for cones. The best cones are the better than the ones I get from the next. Uh, this, this big tree right up here is, uh, it's kind of an unusual fig tree. What's, what's unusual about this fig tree? Well, this is my first fig tree. I always eat figs from other people's trees. And then I got this sign on this fig tree here. It says here in 1 Kings 20 and 7, and Isaiah said, take a lump of fig leaves, and he took it and he laid it on the ball, and he recovered. That's St. Matthew 24, 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branches is, is uh, yet tender and put it forth, for the fourth leave, you know that uh, summer is nigh. So likewise, as when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. See, like these things I told you, it's coming to pass. Uh -huh. Well, right now, you're at the right season to do just exactly what Jesus said. Did you see these buds coming out right here? Uh -huh. Well, there's a scripture right here at the particular time that you come here. And this here uh, means that summer is nigh at hand, right on us right now. Men, you are living in a glorious time because we're living in the day of harvest, and that's always a beautiful time. People are weeping and worrying about the end coming, about the atomic bomb coming. If they was ready to meet God, it should be the glory of the whole setup. That we're in a glorious age when we're fixing to be delivered. You see, there's a, there's a world now getting filled up with little uneasy children. And Jesus speaks of peace being taken from the earth. There's a world now that's getting filled up with teenagers. They don't know what to do. There's a world now where people are in a uh, contest trying to see who can get enough power to destroy the world first. It ain't even fit for a fable, but it's a real story. And uh, Jesus said when these things come upon you, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me, believe in God, believe in me also. For in my Father's house are many mansions. I think and, the favorite painting of yours that I've seen here is the one where you've got faith and worry on the ladders say that, that faith and worry can't live in the same heart. Yeah, you know, there's been people desperately tried to get that, and I just can't let it go till I get another better than it is, you know. And I've done one and let it get out. I don't even have a painting for my home. People ask me, say, Mr. Fenster, do you have any paintings in your house? I said, no. I said, I don't have any in my house because I have pictures of all of them, you know, most all of them. And uh, you see, God didn't call me to fix my house up. And that's one thing my wife bugged me about for the last 15 years. She's bugged me about letting the house go and working on this garden. And uh, I made a deal with her, and when I started this garden, she didn't like the idea of any kind of public place of being around in this place. Well, my garden being, my backyard being two acres big, I, I told her, I said, well, if I tell you what, I said, I'll take the back room in the backyard. You can have the front of the house in the front yard. You do anything you want to with it. Just let me have the backyard. And I said, if a fella can't maintain his own backyard, I said, he needs to move on. I said, I'm So we got a little agreement started there. So you took the backyard and That's created right. this living garden. Yeah. And you just keep right on creating. Yeah. I told her, I said, I'll have more visitors in my backyard than you'll ever see on your front porch. <laughs> And I do. I have uh, thousands of people through the years. And we've through. seen them this morning coming yeah. through. Yeah, they've come in here. Well, that's a local group. Now, for years, a local group wouldn't come here. They considered me as a kind of a garbage collector. And some of these dignitaries around here at Pastors, you know, that one of them come in here one day and they're snooping around, you know, and it seemed like he wanted to make some kind of crit criticism, you know, and said, I'd just like to know what you call this place anyhow. Mr. Fenster, I said, well, sir, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what it is. I said, it's my backyard. I said, you right now in my backyard. And boy, he got out of here, you know. He didn't like the idea of a first Baptist pastor being in a man's backyard. He got out of here. And this, well, I surely appreciate you, know, you bringing us into your backyard. It's, yeah. It's been a well, nice, it's, nice it's day, a nice trip.
they somehow sisters over yonder. Because they somehow brothers over yonder. And they go through that whole verse, and then they come down and say, Some have a savior over yonder. They make a long song out of that, you know. make up a little in the young folks, you know. Like when I was out in California, I made a little song up. See, sometimes I get in the category of different ages. And I told them out there, I said, I've become a young man all at once, and I want to sing a young song to young people, you know, and I sung this. Just a hanging around old California land All the pretty girls fell into my hand strip the young people out of their generation. And then when a fella gets old like me, he has to let the kid be the kid. He has to let the young people still be the young people. A lot of old folks, when they get old, they want all the young people to get old. They don't want no smooching or no courting around. And a lot of people, when they get old, they want all the kids to get old. They don't want no Halloween or no foolishness like that, and no Santa Claus. And some people are actually selfish, George. They just want everybody to be old because they get old. <laughs> Uh, I'll sing it to my 